Good morning. Welcome to worship here today. My name is Carl Schollen. I am the campus pastor at Great Plains Lutheran High School in Watertown, South Dakota. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve you here today. Uh, The order of service is printed in the worship folder for us. Knowing that the Lord will bless our worship this morning, we'll begin with the singing of the opening hymn, Hymn 918. the congregation to rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. 
For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our first lesson today from chapter 7. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent a message to Jeroboam king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more, Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. We'll continue with the singing of Psalm 78.
our second reading from Titus chapter 1. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. The Word of the Lord. We invite the congregation to rise. of Mark chapter 6. This will also be the basis of our message this morning. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 898.
could hear them. Help, Lord Jesus, help them nourish our dear children with your word. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for meditation this morning is our gospel lesson. We'll reread the first verse. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. The word of the Lord, let us pray. O Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the status of our synod right now? Are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? I guess it depends at how you look at it. There are a number of different factors you could look at. One, financially, we're, we're doing pretty well. Even as we struggle through these difficult economic times, God's people are still being very generous to support their churches and our greater church, the Wisconsin Synod. If you're looking at our Lutheran Area Lutheran high schools, our numbers are doing great. Our grade schools are filled with individuals who are sick of what the world has to offer and they want something better, they want something more. Other numbers aren't looking so great. Our synod schools are struggling to some extent. The numbers of graduates coming out of Martin Luther College to fill classrooms and pulpits seems a little small right now. And for congregations that have been struggling to get a pastor, it hurts to see. God's people want a shepherd and there are no shepherds to care for them at this time. What are we doing? Is our call process wrong? That's very different than what Jesus did with his disciples in our lesson. It's not wrong, it's different. And if you look at the call list on a weekly basis, it seems like for every one pastoral call that is accepted, there are 15 to 20 pastoral calls that are returned, and they stay at their current ministry. Jesus sent out his disciples on a special mission in a special way. And that doesn't mean that we have to mimic that exactly in order for us to be successful as a church body. And as we dig in to see what Jesus did with his disciples, we see that we in fact are successful. Maybe not always in an earthly mindset, but when you look at the heart and core of what Jesus wants... He wants the gospel preached to all. Jesus had gone back to his hometown. The people there knew him. They grew up with him. And his ministry was not successful there. The people rejected him. They were too familiar with him and his parents. How could this man possibly be the Messiah that we're waiting for? And they rejected him. 
They rejected the bread and water of life. And so he went elsewhere as a condemnation against them. He performed miracles. He taught the Word. And then he sent out his disciples to do the same. Now it's your turn, he said. He sent them out two by two with, from a worldly perspective, not many resources. What did he say they could take? Well, they could go in pairs of two, so they'd have a confidant, they'd have a support system between the two of them. They could carry a staff, which was certainly beneficial at that time in that place. Uh, walking everywhere, you'd need that staff for going up hillsides and mountains, for defending yourself against criminal and vermin and wild animals. They could wear sandals on their feet. But beyond that, Jesus said, don't take anything else. Don't take bread. What you need on a daily basis to feed yourself. Don't take money. The possibility of buying bread if you're hungry. And don't take two coats. Just one. Again, in their culture, they'd have uh, two cloaks. They'd have an inner lighter cloak, a garment that they would wear, and then they'd have a, a heavier overcoat. Uh, this would protect them from the dust and traveling down the road. For travelers, they would use this cloak as a blanket or a pillow at nighttime. They were only to take their light clothes. No protection from the wind and the weather and everything else out there. It seems like Jesus sent them out very ill-prepared. But he did this with absolute purpose. Several reasons. He wanted his disciples to trust him. To trust his words that as they went out and preached the gospel as he instructed them that there would be success. Not that they would be fed, but that people would hear the word, believe the word, and have their hearts so moved that they could provide for the needs of the disciples who were sent out. Jesus wanted his disciples to trust him fully. He wanted his disciples to be wise with their resources. A child who <laughs> earns birthday money and seems to have money bursting out of their pockets, and they just want to spend it. And oftentimes, I've got four young kids at home, those purchases that they want and desire are frivolous and worthless, and the toy will break soon or the candy will be gone soon. That's what happens when you have a lot of resources. You don't spend it wisely. But for these disciples, they were very limited with what they had. They had to be very particular how they would spend any of their resources. And similarly, if they had a lot of resources, it might burden their journey more than just the weight. It might cause them to not do the task at hand. If they had money in their pouch and a cloak on their back, maybe they wouldn't have been too motivated to go out and preach the message. They tried once, nobody responded, so they said, well, we can just hole up outside of town for a few days. We can go into town and buy some food if we need it. And then at the end, we can just go back and tell Jesus what it didn't really work out all that well. And they would have trusted in that wealth rather than in the promises that Jesus had given to them. 
And I think all of these principles still apply to God's people and God's church today. I don't hear very often about a lottery winner saying, I'm going to give a million dollars to this church and this ministry and this school. I've had that thought in my head. Perhaps you have too. If I ever won the lottery, boy, a lot of people would benefit from this. Great Plains Lutheran High School could build a greenhouse. We could build a football field. I could help out all of these struggling churches. I could give more money to the Synod and to MLC to finish various projects. Boy, wouldn't that be great? It would be great to an extent, but there would be a problem with that. One, it would take away opportunity for other people to dig into their hearts and be motivated to help with these ministries as well. And those who are in those ministries, they'd have this slush fund. Uh, wealth beyond what they've be been accustomed to or expected. What are we going to do with this? You would pray that all of these ministries would be wise with additional funding, and yet we know the sinful heart rears its ugly head all too often. And so I think there's a good reason why God doesn't let Christians win the lottery all too often. God doesn't want anything to impede the ministry of the gospel. Would a congregation become too content with sitting there? We have our regular members. We don't have to go out and do hard work knock on doors, talk to strangers and share the gospel with them because our church is going to do just fine. We have all of this money to provide for our pastor and pay our bills for a very long time. We might lose sight of the mission that God has placed in front of us. Yes, just as Jesus sent out these disciples Seemingly with very little, he promised to bless them. And that same blessing and promise applies to his churches still today. These disciples were to go and stay in the houses of people who were worthy. The Gospel of Matthew adds a little bit. People who were worthy. People who heard the message whose hearts were moved to support these men in their ministry and to open their home, welcome them with a place for them to stay. Likewise, congregations open up their home, their parsonage, and pay for the needs of their pastor because they know that he is sharing God's message of salvation with them. The absolute necessity of their life. And they've deemed it important for them and for their future and the future of their children and grandchildren. As Jesus sent out the disciples, He didn't offer them a whole lot physically. But spiritually, they were ready. Spiritually, they were powerfully amped up and ready to go uh, because of what they were able to do. Jesus granted them the ability to perform miracles, to heal the sick, to drive out demons and unclean spirits. These disciples had been with Jesus. They had seen Jesus do these things with their own eyes. And now they were able to do it themselves. Can you imagine how happy, how giddy they were to be able to help out their fellow Israelites with what afflicted them? To heal them of what was wrong. I'm sure their hearts were filled with that joy. 
What was the purpose of these miracles? The same purpose as Jesus' own miracles, as signs. On my two and a half hour drive here this morning, I couldn't tell you how many billboards and signs that I saw. Lots of information out there to get your attention to focus on one thing, whether it's buying some fast food or where do I turn for my roofing repair because of the recent hail storm. Those signs get your attention. They draw you in. The miracles of Jesus drew people in not so that they could make Him their King of this life, but so that they could hear His words. And He gave the same opportunity to His disciples. Let the crowds come to them, not so that they could be superstars and celebrities, but so that they too could share the message of Jesus. The powerful Word of God. Law and Gospel. We know the necessity of the law. We know the sinfulness of our hearts. We know the sinfulness of the world enticing us on a daily basis. And we need to be reminded of the law, that we are sinners, that are, we are deserving of death and damnation apart from God and His love. That's the message that the disciples had to deliver. For those who rejected them, they were to walk out of town and shake the dust off of their sandals back at the town. This was a great insult to them. Because the people were saying, we don't need God, we don't need this message that's being proclaimed to us. And they wanted nothing to do with God. And so the disciples, as they left town, were saying to these people who needed to hear the law, that if you are rejecting God, God is rejecting you. So much so that the dust of your town, I don't even want it to travel with me. It can stay here because of who you are and because of whom you have rejected. That's a powerful message. It's a message that each one of us and everyone in this community needs to hear and be reminded of on a regular basis. We are sinners, deserving of death apart from God. But that's the beautiful part of the Word of God is that there's a second part to that message, another most necessary message that God does indeed love sinners. That God has forgiven His people. That's the reason why Jesus came into the world, so that He might suffer and die for all of our sins, not so that He could perform miracles, not so that He could send the disciples out so they could perform miracles, but to die. To make that once and for all sacrifice for every soul on this earth. That was Jesus' purpose. That is still His purpose today. And that is the message that He wants continually proclaimed from pulpits in churches across the world. It would be wonderful if we could still have those miracles, signs, and wonders. To stand in front of a church to heal disease, to heal sorrow and suffering, would be a joy and a delight. People would be flocking to churches to see these miracles. And we could say, of course, they would come and they would always hear the Word of God too. They would hear of Jesus' love. But many people would come only for the signs and wonders. And they would close their ears 
to Jesus' love, only wanting what could benefit them immediately and temporarily, failing to see the great necessity of Jesus for their eternal lives. Jesus sent out the twelve with power, with signs and wonders, with a powerful message so that God's kingdom could be proclaimed. And God's kingdom is still proclaimed today by pastors and churches all over. Because that is how important this message is. This message will never be lost. The Spirit will ensure that. It is a serious task that must be completed. It's a serious task that you have undertaken. Supporting a full-time public minister to preach to you from the pulpit every Sunday. To serve your spiritual needs on a weekly basis if you're in the hospital or if you're struggling with something. You see how important it is for you and your children and your grandchildren that you have embraced this. Continue to hold dear to this ministry, for it is yours. It has been given to you by God Himself. He's entrusted you with this important task to care for the minister the shepherd who feeds you. We don't know how long a pastor is going to serve any one congregation. There are a lot of vacancies out there right now, and it seems like eligible pastors will be receiving calls every six months. We don't know how long we'll be in any one location to serve God and His people. And yet God's people ski and they know the importance of having that minister there. Continue to see that. Continue to embrace that and love your shepherd. To show him how much you appreciate him and care for him. For this is the Lord's will for you. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We invite the congregation to rise. And we join in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we gather our offering to the Lord.
Father in heaven, bless this offering which we bring, prospering its work in your kingdom to provide the gospel to others. May it be followed by our regular gifts, each generously and cheerfully given. May the example of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf uh, teach us to be unselfish and love in humble service to bring salvation to others. In his name we ask it. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Let your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. O God, my Father in heaven, bless every effort to establish peace in our country. Give wisdom and strength to those who lead. May the events of this weekend uh, not flow over and affect more people. May you give us stability going into the fall, and may there be a, a peaceful election. May there be... Um, continue to bless the work that is being done here in this country. May we continue to be a free and prosperous nation. Hear us, Lord, now as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with singing our next hymn, 895, Preach You the Word.
rise for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated and will join in singing our closing hymn.